don't worry about it. How many times have you heard those words or words similar to that? Those four words, don't worry about it, are in combination with one another, probably the most useless words in the English language. They're useless not because banishing worry isn't a good idea. Generally, it is. They're useless because most of us totally ignore it and find it practically impossible to obey it. Consider some of the things that people worry about. You know, some of those bad scenarios that they come up with in their mind that they might think hap- could happen to them. I mean, these experiences are um, fearsome, but we forget how rarely these bad scenarios that we conjure up in our mind actually take place. Very rarely do they come to fruition. Like some people worry about flying in an airplane, but you're more likely to get struck by lightning than to die in an airplane accident. We worry about getting hit by a tornado here in Kansas, but you're more likely to get hit by a car crossing a street than hit by a tornado, unless you live in Moore, Oklahoma. There's an exception there. But in our world today, the one that's causing the greatest anxiety for us is the fear of a jihadi terrorist attack. The appalling images of the Twin Towers falling are just seared into our national psyche. But that happened 14 years ago. And since that time, we've not had anything nearly that massive happen. Okay, yes, we've had some jihadi attacks like Nadal Hassan at Fort Hood and the recruiting army office there in Chattanooga and now in San Bernardino, California. But nothing as massive as what happened on that September 11th day. These incidents that have happened since are horrific enough, but nothing compared to the Twin Towers. And yet... Jihadi attack, because we hear it on the news constantly, is a source of constant anxiety for us Americans. What are some other possible things that could happen, but improbable to happen? Like getting hit by an asteroid? Hasn't a movie been made about something like that happening? Or getting bit by a shark when you're swimming in the ocean? Did you know that this past summer was the worst for shark attacks in decades along the East Coast? And then the one that we always seem to worry about, the collapse of the economy and the dollar. Let me tell you, if there's something that you fear, I can guarantee you someone is worrying about it. Now, some psychologists uh, have a definition that they have borrowed from medical and that a difference between acute anxiety and chronic anxiety. Acute anxiety is responding to immediate threat. Like, if you walk out the front door and are face, come face to face with a grizzly bear, that's acute anxiety. That's an immediate threat. But if you wake up in the morning with some free-floating dread and cannot pinpoint where this foreboding is coming from, then you're probably suffering from chronic anxiety. And major life changes can bring on chronic anxiety, you know, like the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or moving to a new location. Any of those things can uh, bring on a descent into chronic anxiety. But the word anxiety comes from a Latin word called, uh, angra is the Latin word. And the literal word means to strangle or to choke. When anxiety's bony fingers gets wrapped around your neck, you'll soon be gasping for air. Another English word that comes from this Latin root is angina. You know, that sharp pain of the heart that you feel when um, your arterial arteries are being choked off by plaque so that your heart muscle's not getting enough oxygen. Another English word, as you may expect, that comes from the Latin word angra is the word anger. Anxious people often become angry people. 
they lash out at what they think is choking off their life within them and whatever they imagine that to be. So anxious, angina, anger, the ingredients of a chronic consternation complex that's plaguing us in these trying times. We've been subjected to the mainstream media's alarmist propaganda for so long that most of us believe that this world is just simply a dangerous, scary place to live. And although we may imagine ourselves to be the most anxious, ridden society on the face of the earth, you know, thinking back to maybe those pre-industrial times that were our golden age of serenity, a quick look in, back into history and even scripture here says that that's hardly the case at all. Speaking God's word to a community of Israelites who lived in chronic anxiety of the captivity in Babylon Isaiah says to them, don't worry about it, or something similar to that. <laughs> really what Isaiah said to them was, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You know, if we think we have anxiety in our lives, it can be hard for us to even conceive of the anxiety that the Jewish people went through in the Babylonian captivity. I mean, not only uprooted from their homes, but living in a foreign land that they had no clue of what the culture was like. The extent of the disruption of their lives of the exiles is beyond even our scope of ordinary experiences. We are a mobile society, yes. I mean, we're willing to pack up and move across the continent for a, a job or for a family. Yet, even when we do that, I mean, we, all it takes is to get on an airplane and in a couple of hours we're back to where we've come from. But what made the Israelites so anxious in this situation was their theology about the land. They were proud to be the chosen people who Moses led out of Egypt to the land flowing with milk and honey. And being in that land, that land was their constant reminder that God was in their court, that they were under God's favor. It was a continual reminder of God's divine presence and grace with him. And the temple in Jerusalem was for them the center of the spiritual universe. Now, they were stuck in Babylon. Not only were they concerned about their immediate physical well-being, they were anxious about whether they were even God's people anymore. How could they worship God without the temple? Their feelings are, saw, are, are summed up in Psalm 137 when they say, how can we sing the Lord's song? in a foreign land. Well, Isaiah gives these highly anxious people a word from the Lord. He says, your service has been completed and your sins have been paid for. Who but the Lord could accomplish such a wonder, redeeming the exiles from their hopeless situation? How could such a miraculous release from their captivity happen unless it was the Lord who willed it? So powerful was this promise that Isaiah speaks as if it had already happened. He says to them, you who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the... Say to the 
towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. He rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accomplishes, accompanies him. This word speaks to us as well. Because we're not the first generation of humans to live and feel anxious and worry about things. We're not the first generation of humans who have experienced a loss or a tragedy. True, we often use our mass media uh, technology to uh, build an echo chamber and amplify our modern anxieties. But the fundamental principles of the fact are the same. We are, by nature, anxious people. At times, worry does help us be vigilant and ward off tangible threats. But more often than not, it's an empty burden. Our Bible text from Isaiah comes to us as well and tells us, don't worry about it. Why? Because God created you Because God formed you. When you build or create something, you know how it is made, inside and out. Our God knows you better than you know yourselves. Moreover, God himself is coming to rescue you. God paid for your sins. He has called you by name. God says to you, you are mine. In other words, God is with us. Worry is often a lack of trust. If we truly believe that God is with us, how can we be anxious about anything that crosses our pathways? Does this mean that we'll not have trials to pass through? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that we're not going to have fires to put out? No, it doesn't. But we'll probably not face a terrorist attack, although we may deal with a heart attack. We're not going to deal with shark bites so much as we might be dealing with the biting of some comments that others make of us. We'll probably not experience a home intrusion although we may experience an intrusion into our time and an unwelcomed interruption. The truth is, if we insist on worrying about stuff that might happen, it won't take us long to find possibilities. Yet in the midst of those possibilities, in the midst of our anxiousness, God speaks to us, comfort because God is the only comfort that really works. He reminds us that we are in God's hands and nothing is more powerful in this world than the hand of God. Nothing can take us out of the hand of our God. His arm is a mighty arm. Let the comforting voice of Isaiah Ring in your ears this Advent. Yes, there are worries in life, and yes, we may be tempted to look at all sorts of places to ease them. Yet, there is only one who has the power to help. And he does so without looking or consulting any threat assessment charts. He does so out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy. This is good news for Zion. This is good news for God's people. Good news came to us in Jesus. The Word made flesh, born in Bethlehem. And so may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.